Hi everybody and welcome to another Fuds on Film podcast. I am Craig Eastman and with me tonight, Scott Morris. Well, hello there. Scott will be talking in a little bit about Inside Out and later in the show, uh, Drew, who is not present uh, at the moment because he's on assignment in France, um, has nonetheless kindly filed a review of The Legend of Barney Thompson. Um, somewhere in the midst of that lot, we will be doing a feature review of the Mission Impossible series to date uh, in celebration of the fifth film's release at cinemas. Um, but first of all, I guess, Scott, uh, tell us a little bit about Inside Out. Inside Out, of course, the latest Disney Pixar film, which uh, I believe gets its traditional baffling delay in release in the UK. Not too long out here. Uh, it's based on the premise that uh, everyone inside their head has a variety of conflicting emotions that drives them through life and those emotions in this film are controlled by lovable comic characters such as uh, Amy Poehler's Joy, Phyllis Smith's Sadness, uh, Bill Hader's playing the, the fear, Lewis Black's anger, Mindy Kaling's disgust and all these combine to drive the young Riley through her life and in particular it's dealing with her moving from her happy Midwest town to San Francisco. Now, it's certainly a, a fairly imaginative premise. It's one that's not really been seen before, unless, of course, you've read The Beano and Remember the Numbskulls, which is uh, not too far away from it. But this is not quite the cinematic adaptation of it. There is a thing that I've got with Pixar movies, is that for some reason they tend not to impress me as much as they do everyone else. And I'm not quite sure why that is. I think I seem to always be hypercritical about Inside Out, and I think I think, I think it's because your heart runs cold. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm many ways emotionless, like a a robot or Terminator, but <laughs> only for Pixar films for some reason. Um, and I think I found my nadir in finding the the least valid reason for not fully enjoying this film yet. <laughs> um, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna try and ignore that so much because. I have to agree with most of the rest of the reviews I've seen of this. It is really imaginative. It's frequently very funny. There are some great turns in there. Um, in particular, Richard Kind's somewhat discarded imaginary friend, Bing Bong, does a tremendous turn in it, and he's hilarious throughout it. Uh, there's a lot of really great things going on. There's some tremendously imaginative little animation scenes as they sort of play with uh, dimensions as they kind of as they in. in the story are going through the, the part of the brain that deals with abstract thought, which comes out with some really interesting visual elements that I think are quite brave to put in there. And in general, it's got an awful lot to recommend to it. My reason for not enjoying it so much is so trivial, I, I hesitate to say it because it makes me sound like a total fruit. But um, <laughs> that's, to me, it seems that having emotions and things like that be so... We're talking about very complex things. They're trying to present them to a young audience, which obviously entails a hell of a lot of simplification. I do feel that this may be something of a stretch and oversimplification. If your people are, according to this, become sad or things because one particular emotion gets in control, that's fine, but it also is dealing with some emotions in a control centre running away and being less available to control the bodies as it should, and... It seems like it's almost trying to explain mental illness by a small animated character in your head having fallen down a hole. <laughs> and, and that seems a little bit patronising to me. But that is really... I think I'm happy to say that this is just one of my ridiculous little hang-ups and I'm, I'm not quite sure why it's bothering me so much, but it was just sort of nagging in my head all the way throughout the film. But even with that, I have to recognise that it, it's... One of Pixar's better films. It's not quite the same level of just absolute genius as something like the Toy Stories, uh, mm. two and three, and one of the top tier. It's not quite the absolute top of the tree for Pixar for me, but it's certainly one of the better ones. It's you know leaps ahead of the path they might be taking with Cars too. They seem mm. to have thankfully gone away from that and they're taking a bit more risks, even when it doesn't quite work out with things like Brave. This is certainly a cut above that and it's good to see they're still finding new things to do and new ideas to put on screen. Heartily recommend it and I think you can ignore any any reservations I have as me just being a bit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a, it's a very brave subject matter for the House of Mouse I think. I mean hats off to them. I think, the, I think they have to be applauded for tackling the subject of mental health in an animated movie pitched primarily at kids. Whether or not kids themselves will gain all that much insight or you know material for discussion from it yeah, um, well, as uh, as adults will, I mean, in some respects, from what I understand of the film, yeah, it's a little bit mixed message to have this topic, which is, and I know people are always citing that, you know, don't underestimate kids when it comes to the topics that you can discuss, but I, I would assume mental health issues are probably above 
the remit of most eight to ten year olds who this was probably aimed at and to therefore simplify it to a point where it also is perhaps a little patronizing to adults that would that would seem to be the dichotomy there but yeah i still say hats off to them the mental health thing i don't want to labor too much that's a bit of an extrapolation for me that the basic message of this film is that you know sometimes it's okay to be sad Mm. Uh, and it's dealing more thematically with the sort of emotional maturity that you get as you start going from i think that the kid's about uh about 10 ish get that kind of age as you get there and it's it's more the kind of idea that you know memories that were once completely happy can then become sort of tinged by sadness or fear Mm. or anger or regret as as you develop yourself and as you you can grow older and realize that that man wasn't your uncle after all (laughs) and there's a reason there's a reason why he always came around and brought you toys when dad was at work (laughs) ah dear um cool interesting stuff that's i feel like i should i feel like i should have a little more to check out behind it there but never mind so to be recommended then Let's allow Drew to give you some insight into the legend of Barney Thompson and then we will move on to the meat and potatoes of this bitch, which is the Mission Impossible franchise. But for now, over to Drew. For his directorial debut, Robert Carlyle has picked an adaptation of the first of Douglas Lindsay's seven Barney Thompson novels, The Long Midnight of Barney Thompson, here retitled as The Legend of Barney Thompson. Carlyle himself stars as Thompson, a down-at-heel Glasgow barber with, as he admits himself, Nay Patter, who hangs over his customers like a haunted tree. When he accidentally kills his boss with a pair of hairdressing scissors, he panics and stuffs the body into his car. Leaving it there attracts the attention of the local dogs, just as the disappearance of his boss attracts the attention of the police. Barney acts like a very, very guilty man when he is questioned about his employer's whereabouts by the police, putting him squarely in the sights of Ray Winston's Detective Inspector Holdall who has been, unsuccessfully, looking for a serial killer who has been sending portions of the victims to their family members to the post. And things would probably look quite bleak for Barney were it not for the assistance of his mother Semolina, who aids her son by efficiently dismembering the body and storing it in her freezer. Neatly labelled, of course. Barney does himself no favours though by accidentally killing someone else, and then, unexpectedly, crossing paths with the real serial killer. Set in a weirdly timeless and unpopulated Glasgow, the clothes, cars, mobile phones and chauvinism suggest a setting anywhere between 1960 and now, The Legend of Barney Thompson is a blackly comic farce, though unfortunately works too inconsistently to be regarded amongst the ranks of the Ealing comedies and early Coen Brothers films that it at times evokes. I'd suggest that much of that is due to Carlyle being a first-time director, Learning the ropes as he is, he doesn't yet have the deftness of touch or sense of timing that such a tragic comic story needs to really work. There are, however, plenty of laughs to be had, albeit unevenly spread out, and some of the subplots, like Ashley Jensen's career politics with Ray Winston's fellow police officer, fall flat, as does, unfortunately, the film's climactic scene. None of which is to say that it isn't enjoyable, though. Carlyle makes his hapless, hair-cutting protagonist both likeable and sympathetic, there is entertaining support from Ray Winston, a sadly underused Tom Courtney, and a delightful, scenery-chewing turn from Emma Thompson, who, a few bum notes in her accent aside, steals the show as Barney's mother. As such, I'd definitely recommend seeing it if you can. There are more than enough laughs to be had to temper the disappointment of it not quite delivering on its promise. So then, on to the Mission Impossible franchise, helmed up by one Mr. Tom Cruise. With the fifth Mission Impossible film now in cinemas, and the franchise spanning some almost 20 years now, it seemed like as good a time as any to go back and retrospectively review the franchise from start to end. Um, Or end at least as it sits for now. Um, I'm fairly sure we'll be seeing further entries in this series. Certainly if the current box office of this instalment has anything to do with it. But Scott, we recently rewatched the entire series of Mission Impossible films, not necessarily in chronological order, but to uh, refresh our memories a bit. And I guess now we wanted to have a little bit of a chat, I suppose, about the first Mission Impossible film. Yeah, we'll just tackle these in in the order they came. Uh, Why not? Yeah, it's it's just, it is puzzling to think that it was 1996 when this first came out. It just, it seems to have creeped up on us that it's been nearly two decades since Mm. the first one. It's never a franchise that's been, you know, continually beating us over the head with, but it's been a, a consistent and intermittent staple for 
cinema for the past nearly two decades. So that is kind of remarkable. There's very few other films that get up to that level of franchise. The first one, you see a very fresh-faced uh, <laughs> Tom Cruise stepping into the role as Ethan wow. Hunt. In very a- fresh-faced. A real <laughs> shock, actually, watching that again. I don't feel like it's been so long since I watched the first one, and yet just to watch it last week, the first yeah. thing that struck myself uh, and my wife, actually, were just, just how young he looks. Yeah, and I think it's strange because when you look at Tom Cruise, thanks to a a combination of not at all surgery, no, I don't want to suggest that, but he doesn't look like an old person. You know, he certainly does not look his age, but when you go look back at his earlier career in particular, well, case in point, this one, he looks like he's 12. He looks like a young boy that has stepped off the... Very (laughs) much so. ...somehow become a secret agent. It's very strange. And then in four short, the four short intervening years somewhere, and I can't think what other films were in between, but at some point, I I posted a little comparison on Twitter last night between this and Mission Impossible 2, all of a sudden a a switch was flicked, and it's very much the Tom Cruise who you recognise now. It's really bizarre. Yeah, it's it's puzzling, isn't it? It's like his face set or something like that between (laughs) films. People kept telling him, if you keep grinning like that, pal, one day the wind's going to (laughs) change. To the matter at hand, he is an IMF agent, the Impossible Missions Force. Of course, this series is based on the uh, Eon's old uh, television show and takes much the same tactics and just amps up the uh, cinematic voltage. It's a tale of him basically being betrayed and trying to clear his name. He's on a routine enough mission to intercept the this one is a the first one's a list of spies for the various undercover nations a list of two halves yeah basically his entire squad is presumed is killed or are they at the start of the film and he's immediately accused of being a mole in the IMF and has to go rogue in order to clear his name along with a force of previously disavowed agents something something that becomes a bit of a theme throughout the series really yeah does have to keep going back to that i think i guess because they're the only people that could possibly cope to deal with uh, this fantastical agency and their fantastical training (laughs) Uh, which is uh, i suppose perhaps a weakness of it but i have to say that the first film holds up an awful lot better than i recall it doing Mm. i had very vivid memories of this actually being a pretty poor film all round. I can only assume I was thinking of the Mission Impossible N64 game, which was <laughs> abysmal. And that is a in the same way that Goldeneye, I have a lot more love for Goldeneye and think it's actually not that very good, but because the N sixty four game was really great, it's, it's somehow <laughs> the two have kind of bled across each other somehow. Bizarre Fry Span Fry? Uh, spy franchises <laughs> oh fry spanchises as well I suppose. fry <laughs> spanchises should be so closely tied to their N64 um, <laughs> counterparts yeah. most bizarre yeah so it's uh, directed by Brian De Palma and it does look quite De Palmarian in a way that mm. um, blockbusters these days tend not to there's mm. often very little authorism if you, if you like in most of the, the cinematic landscape of the, certainly the big blockbuster tent poles but this film looks very much like a De Palma film it's all weird angles and yeah. you know shifty eyes and things like that and I think that does lend quite a, a useful air I absolutely of, um, agree one, to it. one of the things that, that really makes the film work for me is that it, visually it stands out so I mean it's, it's got all the it's got all the trappings of a, a big summer blockbuster in terms of the money that's been thrown at the screen yeah. but at the same time De Palma's directorial style of edits and tricky camera angles, which you've just mentioned, often of a Hitchcockian bent, lend a really distinctive visual style and it also generates some genuine suspense. Yeah, it's not perfect, it wasn't at the time, and certain elements of it have aged very poorly. Mm. As is common, I'm not going to uh, beat it up too much about this given the, the time frame, but in 1996 was not a good vintage for computers being represented in cinema, and <laughs> this is... <laughs> This lives up to that. It is uh, quite laughable anywhere to go anywhere near a computer screen, but I'll kind of let that go as an oversimplification to an mm. audience that simply weren't that familiar with the internet and things like that at the time, and not so afraid with the technology that afraid. I think also, regrettably, the computer work behind the screen as well in terms of some exactly. of the effects work, especially in the last act, it was kind of pushing the envelope a little bit too much for what we could realistically yeah. expect. It, that hasn't aged well. Possibly why I remember it so poorly. Um, mm. You know, films have they need a strong opening and they need a strong ending. The bit in the middle can more or less go to pot and it can still recover from it. But this is kind of the opposite. The, all of that middle act is actually, I think, very well effectively done. But mm. the CG train nonsense at the end is not so great. I do wonder if there was. I just get the impression that the Palma would have been happier if it had ended with a you know a fight in a train uh, engine room between Voight and Ethan Hunt. Yeah, um, something far more low key. 
low-keyer and grittier rather than, than some suit. I, I just like blaming it on suits rather than anyone else. They came in, nah, more action, go back. Yeah, put I mean, a, De not a, 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 De Palma's not a guy whose career has been built on pushing visual effects, let's be honest. So I can yeah. imagine, I have no reason to suppose or evidence to support my theory that at that point, you basically just went to the effects guys, look, have the train get chased by a helicopter into the tunnel. This has happened, this has happened. Just, just, just do it, guys, because I haven't got a clue what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that is really the two knocks that I've got against it are basically aging technology mm. is re- really about the only thing that I think this film does wrong. In retrospect, you could perhaps see the twists coming. They're not the most imaginative of ways around the uh, the problem that, that Ethan Hunt is presented with. Uh, you might have guessed it already. I can't remember if I did so at the time. I generally wasn't. I'm generally not the kind of person that goes into there actually thinking about how twists are going to work out anyway. So I'm sure it would have blindsided me in the first instance. But watching it again, it more or less holds up because all those all the plot beats seem to make sense, and it's not doing anything that is you know you know just contradicting itself later on. Really, mm. it all hangs together as a plot, and yeah, so it's actually quite good. I have to say. I think one of the things that works so well for it, I mean, quite apart from the Palma actually pulling off a better trick than I expected, and uh, I mean, Cruz obviously imparting some momentum behind it through sheer force of charisma, which whether you like the guy or not, you can't really deny yeah. it. Is that it does it? It does at least make an effort to indulge in, I mean, some very perfunctory uh, spy craft, but at least has pretenses to some sort of spy craft in one form or another at certain points throughout the film. Not something that you could say about some of the later entries, actually, which tend to be far more sort of acrobatics and um, explosion-oriented. What also does quite well is draw a neat line between what the television show was doing yeah. back in the day and what you could do in a cinema yeah. without changing the nature or character of it. Arguably, by the time you get to the modern era, it's, uh, it's completely different, but this could... You know, feasibly have been an extravagant version of the TV show, which is what I suppose you have to look for in these kind of TV to celluloid transitions. It does make sense on that one, so it's, it's kind of captured the heart of what made the TV show so long-running and quite remarkable at the day, and uh, translated sat into a modern, well, at the time, modern era. Yeah, I think also what's interesting to me is to look back now, at, if I look back at a lot of the reviews that came out at the time, I mean, actually, I think I was in some ways disappointed by it because I think I was at an age where I expected much more action than was actually mm-hmm. delivered. It was at that start of the thing of like trailers completely overpromising and overselling yeah. on the action aspect. Mm-hmm. Um, and so to find out that a lot of it was people talking to each other was something of a disappointment at that point. Although latterly, I've come to appreciate that those bits are actually the best bits. Yeah. <laughs> but at the time, that a lot of criticism was leveled at the fact that the, the plot was considered to be too complicated and it's interesting to note that this is from many of the same critics who bemoan the retardation of summer blockbusters Yeah, I I think if you are, I mean Christopher Nolan um, is always cited recently as being the guy who's shown that audiences will pay for smart blockbuster material yeah. and that it's not asking too much of an audience to actually engage their brains. I don't find this, if you're paying attention then I don't think there's really any problem following the plot. It doesn't depend on the technology to a degree that It'll alienate anyone who isn't computer literate. It's a it's a fairly simple plot at heart. There are plenty of sort of twists and turns in it, but that's I can't help but feel like at this point, before the franchise had established itself as a series of films, and it was actually being sold on the promise as an adaptation or an update of a TV series, that most people would have been buying into it on the pretense that it was based on the TV series, which was all about twists and turns and espionage. Yeah. Um. So I find it a really odd criticism for people to have levelled at it. The other thing that's interesting to note is also recently I, I've read, I'm not sure I was aware at the time, but that people really weren't happy about the treatment of the Jim Phelps character to the extent where, I mean, a large chunk of the cast of the TV show were scheduled for cameo appearances and they all pulled out after it was revealed that Jim Phelps would be a yeah. turncoat, which is really, really strange to me. It's nice in a sort of little solidarity movement kind of way, I suppose, but again, yeah. really, really strange, I think. I think it's actually to the film's credit that that happened and, and whether it was with an eye to this becoming a franchise, I'm not sure that that's something Paramount would have been looking at at that point. Yeah. So actually, I think it was quite brave of them to do that and actually establish that, no, this is something different. It's got the DNA of that. It's carried over some of the tropes from the TV series, like the things that we think will work well on the big scene, like the cool stuff with the masks and all that sort of jazz. But really, we want to kind of wipe a, the slate clean to some extent as well and, and embellish it with our own DNA. Um, and so you end up with things like the now iconic wire sequence, yeah. which still works really well today. 
Yeah. But yeah, I find I find it odd that it was quite so poorly received at the time. And some, some of the reviews are uh, quite vitriolic, actually. But I've always considered it to be, um, if not the best, and potentially perhaps the second best entry in the, uh, the whole series. Yeah, I think the modern ones are very different films and I think are almost judged in different criteria. But... Of the certainly of the first three, this would be my favourite. Yeah, as a film and as a concept that hangs better together than a lot of the other ones, which will become increasingly un- well, not quite increasingly uncomfortable. You will reach the end of the year in Mission Impossible Two, which I suppose we uh, may as well uh, go into. <laughs> shall, if we, want. shall we talk about Mission Impossible? Shall we do that? I think we we'll probably should, but not for long. Uh, we need, uh, and very much the same way that we need to talk about Kevin. Yes, this there's a problem. <laughs> There's a problem in this franchise, and it's Mission Impossible Two, which was <laughs> oh, well, escaped in two thousand. I think is perhaps the way to go. Are you talking about the film that brought us John Woo, who was still hot, and um, Duke Gray Scott? Duke Gray Scott, yeah. Of these things, it turns out that Duke Gray Scott was the bigger credit to the film, and <laughs> that's not a great position to be in. Yeah, a puzzling little entry. It's. Uh, in retrospect, it's just another part of Hollywood never quite finding the right vehicle for John Woo's particular brand of melodrama and action. And with the possible exception of Face Off, which the more you watch it, the, the weaker it becomes, I think. Yeah, it's, time. I still enjoy it, but um, it's now become more it's because it's comfortable. Well. Yeah, yeah they, they just never could quite get a right vehicle for John Woo, and this certainly isn't one. A story by the guys behind some of the... Star Trek TV series there actually I think it's the creators of Deep Space Nine off the top mm. of my head there but it's a somewhat interesting premise and it's, it's the logical place to go is that if you have this uh, super spy with super equipment and all that kind of stuff what possible threat could be enough for them to go up against and they've went for the obvious exclusion of another rogue agent in this instance it's Dougray Scott who had spent in the franchise well according to the, this film's lore if you will has been impersonating Ethan Hunt's character as need be so he has he has intimately studied Ethan Hunt's character and he knows how he will react in any particular situation and he's then held up as a dark mirror of Ethan Hunt when he goes rogue and decides to steal a new bioweapon for further selling on to the black market for a ludicrous amount of money, which I think is perhaps certainly one of the problems of this film is when someone's motivation is money, even if it is just a lot of money, it's mm. a bit it's a bit mundane. Yeah, you know, g- given everything that's going on around it, and that's probably the main reason that uh, Dougray Scott fails to ultimately convince as a villain in this, which does hurt if you're going for a super spy kind of thing the villains are an important part of this but despite that, he's still probably the most entertaining thing, and not just because he's Scottish, <laughs> although obviously that helps and and he's, <laughs> and I often find I remember at the time being like really like really excited about the fact that he's been left to keep his broad Scottish accent as the yeah. common as muck Scottish accent. There's no, there are no airs and graces that you, you thought might have been something. It's quite quite refreshing actually. Yeah, I know a, that's a really trivial point to make, but but between that and the, the sort of it still feels Scottish. There's a little sort of sense of snarky sarcasm about how you know I, I know how Ethan Hunt's going to do it. He's going to Ethan Hunt, of course. He's too afraid to actually hurt anyone, so he'll do some insane acrobatics to get in <laughs> <laughs> instead of capping a couple of security guards. Yeah. So I mean, you can build a good film out of this. It's just not this film. No. You know you're in trouble from the start when he's been told to. Well, not quite the start, but he's told to recruit a professional thief played by Dandy Newton. And the two fall in love by slowly glancing at each other over some people doing flamenco dancing. Mm-hmm. And it's love at first sight for no apparently good reason. And this then becomes a, a relationship you're supposed to care about, despite the fact that it barely exists. A, a relationship in <laughs> slow-mo, Scott. It exists, yeah. in, it exists in bullet time, if not in reality. <laughs> so Ethan's joined by his... Returning from the first film, you've got uh, Ving Rhames as Luther Stickle, who somehow appears in all of the films uh, as the kind of computer and communications expert. And you've also got John Paulson's Billy Baird, whose special (laughs) skill is having a helicopter (laughs) and nothing else. (laughs) Being able to pilot it in a rudimentary fashion. Yes. Well done, Billy. (laughs) The boy done good. Yeah, so there's a lot of terse messing around in Australia leading up to a eventual showdown between Ethan Hunt and Dougray Scott's Sean Ambrose. And it's all just a bit bad. It's dragged out over I think about five or six hours it's two, um, two hours two hours twenty although bafflingly the, the apparently the first cut that John Wood delivered to the studio was over three and a half hours long I, 
there's well, very this, little in the film. How can this, you make it? <laughs> this film is slow mo on top of slow mo. It's it's <laughs> it's the slow mo equivalent of Inception, where they go into a dream within a dream. I can only assume I, what I think has happened is that John Woo hasn't actually technically re-edited the film. He hasn't touched the running order of the film. He hasn't inserted the deleted films. I think he just reverted a lot of slow mo back to real time. <laughs> and that truncated it from three and a half hours to like two hours 20 or whatever the running time is now and that still leaves an awful lot of slow-mo yeah. <laughs> and it's bafflingly it's almost entirely slow-mo of people looking at each other <laughs> such as when Tom Cruise and Candy Crouton are um, <laughs> crashing cars into each other and spinning towards their doom at the, at the edge of a cliff you get about five minutes of them, like Cruz just going cross-eyed and Andy Newton look like, with an expression on her face that suggests she's taken a lot of heroin in the intervening seconds. <laughs> it's but, bizarre. You know, that, that was the clever call back to them in the flamenco and doing the dance, but they're dancing in a car and almost killing themselves in the process. It's, but what it's John Woo doesn't realise, it's not clever uh, to do slow-mo in one bit and then sort of mirror it in another bit and just replace flamenco <laughs> dancers with an Audi and a Porsche. It's bizarre. It's absolutely bizarre. The what, let me tell you though, the one thing that I do appreciate about the slow mo is that Tom Cruise's hair in this movie is beautiful, <laughs> and that is the only good thing about the slow mo. It's almost as beautiful as Kurt Russell's hair in Tango and Cash. <laughs> Tom Cruise's hair in this movie almost made me gay for Tom Cruise. I've got to be honest with you. And in slow motion, it looks like a high end graphics card demo or something running on Real <laughs> Engine Four. It's just, it's ast- <laughs> it's astonishing. I found Tom Cruise more attractive in this film than I did Tandy Newton. <laughs> and I can't, I'm not even going to lie to you. John Woo's style is one of the weak points in this film, and it breaks my heart yeah. to say it. But like you say, none of his holy. At the time, Face Off seemed fantastic, but it really hasn't aged well. And I think, bizarrely, I think the film of, of his Hollywood output that will be remembered with the most fondness and probably the most competence is probably going to be Hard Target at this point, which was also his first. Yeah. It's, it's bizarre that how. And I can only assume it's that whole thing of. Hollywood paying a director who's famed for a particular style and a particular skill set, bringing them to Hollywood and then preventing them from using any of that skill set for most of the movie and that there was probably some contractual obligation that he'd get a certain minute allotment of slow-mo to use and that he'd be allowed to do some motorbike stunts at the end. Yeah. Um, the, oh my God, the, the writing isn't particularly great. Let's see, I, I never thought I'd live to see the day where I say Dugray Scott transcends the material. <laughs> But that's what's happened. The, the plot revolving around this chimera virus is of utterly no consequence. And it's it's the least realised MacGuffin of the series, I think. Like, people make passing mention of it from time to time, but it exists purely to have Tandy Newton inject herself later in the film um, and the 20-hour <laughs> yeah. incubation period then lending a, a, a greater sense of ur- urgency to some motorbike chases. And the notion that she's suddenly worth $37 million for having done it, that was that amused me no end. <laughs> the rest of the film is just a complete mishmash of, I don't know, like just stunts, pointless, pointless stunts that feel contractually obliged. At one stage, Cruz is having a shootout with some guys in a lab, and it's like, the only thing missing is, they might as well have just CG'd a Chow Yun Fat's face onto him and, yeah. given him and given him a matchstick. But at the same time, bizarrely, like being hamstrung by the... PG-13 uh, or here in the UK the 12 certificate that I think the film had there's it's heroic bloodshed but without the bloodshed yeah um, there's a lot of cutaways and just people falling over and stuff it's, it manages to make that stuff not exciting which is which is a feat in and of itself there is also I think I pointed out on my live Twitter feed of this film last night that there is a fantastic vine to be made of all the unnecessary fl- front flips in this film <laughs> it is insane the pointless acrobatics that especially towards the end of the film, that were that a stylistic notion of the film at large and present throughout would make more sense in in and of itself. But they're kind of reserved for the latter acts of the film, by which point it just feels like a different film. And it's, it's ludicrous stuff like, there's a point where he jumps out of the building with his parachute on, and before he opens the parachute, he for no reason whatsoever executes a front roll. Yeah. And then another bit <laughs> later on, just as he's leaving the facility where uh, something happened before the motorbike chase anyway, where he, he leg drops a guy in slow-mo um, <laughs> on, a, on, the, on the side of a hill or a little incline or something, but performs a, an un, entirely unnecessary front flip as he does it, just because presumably <laughs> that looks good in slow-mo again. It's just weird. <laughs> it's just... It's really disjointed at that point. All of all of the insane stunts and like ridiculous acrobatics are backloaded for maximum stupid 
climax effect. There's no pacing to that stuff. So when it does happen, it feels really bizarre and, and dislocated from the rest of the film. Yeah, there's no rhyme or reason to any of the action that occurs in it. It's it's very odd, even though like things like fight choreography just doesn't make any sense. And we look back at it in these days since since things like, you know, the the born identity and all these kind of things have made you know, fighting, if not exactly realistic, a lot more impactful and vaguely sensible. Mm. And you've got these people just flipping and flopping everywhere for no good reason at all and <laughs> wafting around near each other. And he literally <laughs> just does a cartwheel horrible. while firing guns at a guy to like when the, when they first starts being assailed by the guys and more bikes at the end, and there's like no practical reason for him that he's, he's needlessly endangering his life at that point. I was like, it's like well, they did it in the Matrix. That was cool. Was like, yeah, you're not the Matrix. <laughs> you know the one that was set in a computer simulation. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my days, it's really bizarre. And of course, it all climaxes with 20 minutes of daft motorbike stunts, and then this sort of weird homoerotic undercurrent between yeah. Cruz and Degree Scott, where the Basically, they desperately try not to make love to each other on a beach for ten <laughs> minutes at the end. It's all it's all quite odd and a bit of an anticlimax, if I'm honest. Yeah, there's really no sense of drama or excitement throughout any of the film. It's just got a very the weakest linking device to get all these action scenes together, and the action scenes themselves are not of any interest whatsoever. No, the bad guy and the henchmen are not particularly ex- great, and the actual team that Ethan's got. Is Certainly the blandest. Mm. There's no real support there. It's hinging itself entirely on the dynamic between Tom Cruise and Dougray Scott, and it's simply not strong enough. Mm. If all the bits around it were even just a little bit better, it might have been enough to sort of scrape by to become you know, reasonably enjoyable. But yeah. it's cast as the film's only saving grace, but and it's not enough. The action, the plot, everything else around it, it's just not executed well enough, not well realised enough for it to be of any real interest to anyone no it's uh, a, it's a, it very much stands out as the weakest entry in the series and yeah. uh, feels less like a mission impossible film than any of the others i would i would suggest when you when you when you finish on a, a sequence of stunts each one of which individually requires as much suspension of disbelief as pretty much the entire last act of any of the other films yeah. in the series because <laughs> there is obviously an, a great element of of suspension of disbelief i mean there's make no bones about it the, the film's very honest about that but when each of these bizarre motorbike stunts and stuff each requires that same level of suspension of disbelief then it's very difficult to overcome how how um overblown and overwrought an ending that is i guess if mission impossible 2 brought us john woo and dougray scott then mission impossible 3 in 2006 brought us jj abrams fake lens flare and simon Pegg. right yes the third one uh six years and nothing like as successful as mission impossible 2 wound up being although I'm sure a lot of that disappointment might have come from people remembering Mission Impossible 2. Yeah. Um, the third one is plot-wise almost as terse. There's a framing device around it where Ethan Hunt has retired from field work and is now trying to live a more or less normal life. He's just taken a wife and trying to have a, a normal, happy family life. But this is all ruined when one of his favourite protégé agents is captured by a ruthless arms dealer and tortured and killed. And... For one reason or another, uh, Ethan Hunt takes a team to try and take revenge on this arms dealer. The arms dealer, of course, played by Philip Seymour Hoffman. And this is that, cotton socks. This was mainly why I was looking forward to Mission Impossible 3, because mm. obviously he's a tremendous actor. He was, well, was a tremendous actor, and should have been a bit more interesting to, to bounce off. The film itself kind of works, I guess. It's certainly a step up, but that's not really saying an awful lot. Basically, uh, they're trying to they're on the track of Philip Seymour Hoffman, not just because of his for revenge, but also because he has captured a, well, let's be clear, obvious MacGuffin in terms <laughs> of this rabbit foot the, the thing that they are trying to chase through uh, the rest of the film. It's, it does have Simon Pegg. I'd, I'd forgotten he appeared in this film at all, but he's a very mm. minor role as a, a lab technician back in the IMF base. He is there purely as an annoying comedy relief. Yeah. <laughs> the main team that he's put together for this one is uh, Maggie Q, Luther Sticknell, Ving, Ving Rames, of course, is still there uh, as doing the communication side of things. Maggie Q is also a sort of backup action slash obvious distraction for men. And uh, <laughs> also has Jonathan Rhys Meyers, Declan Gormley, whose special skill this is, he can fly a helicopter. Wait a minute, this all sounds to... very familiar. <laughs> yeah, doesn't it, Dust? <laughs> <laughs> He's a little bit better at it than Barney Rubble or whatever his name was in the last one. Yeah. <laughs> and so the whole thing goes more or less as you would expect. Seymour Hoffman, I think... I'm not sure he, does, he doesn't quite nail it. He has a sense of 
he can be sinister at points in the film, but I don't think it's consistently threatening enough no, for it's it not, to really work. It's not it's threatening at parts. It's not as consistently threatening as you might expect, but I'm not entirely sure he wasn't doing something different. Like My observation of this film in terms of Hoffman is that he stands out amongst the entire franchise as the actor of the greatest calibre who they've brought on board to perform yeah. bad guy duties. But somewhat counterintuitively, it's it's possibly with the the most underwritten uh, bad guy character in the series, yeah. which is unfortunate, but he still manages to salve something from that. I mean, Philip Seymour Hoffman, I don't think, is when actors are accused of phoning in a performance, I mean, that's absolutely what you'd expect. And like to his credit, he's just, I just don't think he was capable of doing that as an actor. Even though yeah. he had less than nothing to work with here, he still, he still, you know, he still picked at the bones of it and he, he produced something. And he's certainly a more memorable bad guy than I think exactly. probably anyone else in the franchise. Yeah, if anything else, that might be what saves it. The rest of the film is, to be fair, absolutely fine. Mm. Right? It's a step up in pretty much everything. The pl- I, I thought it was pretty slick and, and one of the, probably, possibly even, actually, and I wasn't that fond of it the first time around, but on second view and recently I kind of found it to be one of the pacier entries. It does bang along quite well. I forget the running time exactly, but it certainly doesn't feel like, I think it's about two hours and ten. I think it's of that ilk, but it certainly doesn't feel slow at any point. It certainly has its moments, and I think it's got enough of them to, to recommend it. It's uh, you know certainly up leaps and bounds ahead of two. It's just I don't know there there is something missing from it. I don't mm. I, I, I did enjoy it. It's perfectly entertaining. It's it's strange to see this is this must be the I think this is J uh, J Abrams' first feature film. And it's mm. very much Lens Flair City. Um, yeah. I know he's got the reputation for it. We're not picking any new ground here. But yeah, that every time, certainly at least the first half an hour seems to be composed entirely of Lens Flair. Yeah. It's like any possible opportunity for lenses to flare. They well, for the first it. half an hour, I thought the bad guy was actually a lens flare. <laughs> and then at some point, the camera angle moved. I'm like, oh God, no, sorry, it's Philip Seymour Hoffman. <laughs> My mistake. It probably wins as well as having some of the more, certainly up until this point in the franchise, the more elaborate schemes, uh, things like the breaking into the Vatican and all that kind mm. of things. I think that's uh, it's quite imaginatively done. And, and, and some of well. it's really fun as well. Crucially, I mean, Mission Impossible 2 completely shed its sense of fun, right? Whereas yeah. whereas this, the sort of stuff with Cruz with his um, his Padre outfit and stuff um, yeah. inside, his, inside his suit and whatnot, is, you know, there are little nice not out and out comic touches. You know, Simon Pegg is there to take care of that and I think that's to the movie's detriment. But there's a nice sense of fun about it as well. It's not taking itself utterly seriously like the last entry did. Yeah, and a, a strange as I think we've alluded to before, this franchise has attracted a, an eclectic mix of directors, shall we say. Yeah. And this one, the development of this one it was going to be a David Fincher film. Then it was going to be a Joe Carnahan film. And it wound up being a J.T. Abrams film, which is a very a strange little trek for it to take. And I think regardless of that, it's, it's it's worked quite well. I think it's it's certainly enjoyable. And all the actors involved, I think, acquit themselves adequately. It's mm. still based largely on Tom Cruise's performance. I think the thing about the family life is probably its weakest aspect. It's another yeah. kind of crutch to try and get a bit of emotional impact to that's, the end and it doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't seem like it's something that Ethan Hunt would be able to do. Even that's, that's one of those Abrams tropes you expect because J.J. Abrams inevitably uh, almost always comes with Alex Kurt- Kurtzman and Roberto Orki in tow and mm. that's just one of those tropes of their particular style of writing or the, the themes that they tend to stick to, I suppose. Although, in fairness, the rest of the film is possibly not as derivative as you might expect as a as a result of that. Yeah. But yeah, this the whole thing around family feels a little bit cheesy. Yeah, I can see it. If this was the last film in the franchise, I can see it, it would work and it would give a nice happy ending to everyone at the yeah. end and you could, you could all walk off in the sunset and it would be a nice way to kind of end that character arc with him, you know, getting out and becoming a, a normal Joe. An ordinary family guy, but that's 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 the problem is that they want this dichotomy between, oh, look, he's, he's just an average family guy, but with an ext- extraordinary skill set. And it was, well, that's the point, is he's he's yeah. not an average guy in it by any way, shape or means. So that just that just doesn't ring true. Yeah. Didn't work out so well for James Bond either. And uh, no. yep, he just can't do it. He just can't do it. <laughs> it. Absolutely didn't. For me, the film succeeds fairly well just on sheer force of momentum, basically. And there it sets up enough dominoes and knocks knocks them over in short enough order that really you're not given time to think too much about the inadequacies of the movie. And I actually think it's one of the stronger entries in the series. Hoffman, like we said, this is this absolutely, I suspect, is one of those where Philip Seymour Hoffman is in board as, as a one for the studio film, but he absolutely transcends that rather than phoning it in. 
as much weight as he lends it, we do still get the sort of bizarre baddies theme continuing with Billy Crudup. Um, <laughs> go figure. We need we need a kind of no name, but you'll recognise him actor in a bad role somewhere. All of this uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman malarkey is a little bit too highbrow. The only thing for me was uh, Simon Pegg, and regrettably Simon Pegg in the next instalment, which I suppose we'll talk about in a minute, was given a an even bigger role, which is which is not what I wanted. But he's not present enough in, in big enough numbers here to undermine the film. So for for me, this kind of I think it's probably my possibly even my second favorite entry in the series. But I've had some feedback on Twitter already tonight. People people seem to like to express their preference for the order of series from good to bad, and everybody has a different notion. So we'll we'll have a look at that later, I suppose. But a couple of people seem to be, or most people, I think, probably rate this as being one of the stronger entries. But of course. Guys, opinions differ and your mileage may vary. Speaking of Mission Impossible 4, Ghost Protocol, 2011, Michael Nyquist is Hendrix, a Soviet radical intent on global conflict. Around the strange the strange notion he has that mankind needs some sort of cleansing and nuclear war is the way to do it. Um, IMF track him to Moscow where he sets them up with an attack that uh, leaves the Kremlin levelled after an explosion as a pretext to a US-Soviet conflict and the IMF team framed for the events. Therefore, once again, you've guessed it, being disavowed and forced to go rogue. Brad Bird struggles to bring much distinct style to this entry, I felt. And I think of all the entries in the series, or sorry, all of the directors chosen in the series, Brad Bird was, I don't know whether that's an interesting choice or just an odd choice. Yeah, I think what stood out for me with this one as well, I think partly it is to do with the genericization of blockbusters. I don't think you really see an awful lot of stylistic input into a lot of the, the, the multi-million dollar stuff that's going on these days. I mean, that's why yeah. something like Man Max was such a standout, because it had such a strong style that wasn't like anything else you've seen. Whereas yeah. you could plug in... If you sort of chopped Avengers in half and inserted any other Marvel film into it, regardless of who directed it, it would still seem the same. Yeah, and uh, I, th- I think that's the, the weakness of the, the two latest entries in this series. Yeah, uh, they are a bit generic. It, it does seem that uh, Brad Bird thinks he's just directing a sequel to The Impossibles at points. Uh, <laughs> it's, I think, first time I watch it, and to an extent, now, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. It does have a lot of you know quirky little fun elements in it, and I think it, it does push that too far. There's points where it's it, it's going for the laughs and where it, it really shouldn't have done a lot of it's on the, the kind of B plots of the things that are going on at the time but still I think it, it could have done with having a bit more seriousness at some points, at various points when, when they're doing some of the sillier stuff like when Benji's trying to levitate Hawkeye through the vents mm. and have him jumping down, it's just, there's, there's a bit too much gurning going on at that point, it should be a bit taken a bit more seriously, yeah. especially given that you've spent the whole scene before it going how dangerously hot everything's going to get and then you just kind of ignored that, all you've done is you just made him a bit sweaty at the end. It's this entry's take on the wire suspension g- gag from, uh, from the first movie, right, except now it seems to be played more for laughs than for tension and it just doesn't work. Yeah, there's too many points of that that kind of deflate it, which is a bit of a shame because there's moments in there that are fantastic. Because I think uh, the whole the whole thing of the uh, you know the Mission Impossible the kind of the gimmick bit that they've got going where they're having the, the two meetings simultaneously and setting up that mm. that's done very well and as a sequence that works great. Yeah. If the more of the film had been like that, of course, then it would be great. Uh, you're paying off the uh, you're, you're finally paying off the first bit of Mission Impossible two with the climbing bit up the uh, Burj Khalifa. I was going to say <laughs> that that sequence is is fairly spectacular and, and congratulations to anyone who got to watch it in IMAX. Um, yeah. <laughs> because I can imagine, as someone who suffers from my own vertigo, I can only <laughs> I can only imagine my terror at the sensation of falling through a cinema screen. There's certainly lots of individual sequences that are great. I think the, the whole thing of the, the chasing through the sandstorm bits, I think, was was pretty well executed as well. That's mm. a, that's very interesting visually, and an interesting little uh, problem to crack. And there's lots of bits like that at the end. Some of the some of the fight at the end, it's a it's a puzzling fight because it shouldn't really come down to physical confrontation between you know. Uh, Aging scientist and Ethan. Yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Somewhere along the flow chart, there was a there was a wrong entry there. Yeah, but nonetheless, it does work quite well. In the whole uh, fighting down the car park, <laughs> the, the rotating car park of doom, and it's but, it's it's, uh, it's suitably crunchy in places. That is quite effective. But again, you you've undermined that a little bit earlier by having the ridiculous you know seduction scenes mm. with a, a gurning um, your fella from Slumdog Millionaire. 
whose name escapes me. <laughs> yeah. I would still say I, I enjoyed it, and I think it, it will probably age poorly as it goes on. Yeah, for for me, there, there were issues around this film, and it shares. I think it shares a lot in terms of structure around those individual sort of events that you mentioned with, with Mission Impossible 3. But what it lacks for me, and disappointingly on second view, and I enjoyed this a lot less, the first time I saw it, which was, I think, not at the cinema, but immediately as it became available on demand, I really enjoyed this, and I remember thinking it was possibly at that point the strongest entry in the series. And it's not to say it's not a good film, it's just that in comparison with the others, I've enjoyed it less in second viewing, and I can't help but feel that where it shares a lot with 3, that film, as I pointed out, was kind of propelled along by pace and momentum, carried you through the bits that didn't work so well. And I think some of that pace is missing from this one, and it just isn't as enjoyable as a result. The other part of it that grated this time round was Peg's increased role and don't get me wrong like I like Simon Pegg as an actor but the whole sort of comic relief thing I don't I don't want comic relief in a film built around tension and suspense yeah it's I don't want a release from that my, my payoff will come at the end of the film presumably um I just find that I just find that really um disjointed and, and quite um disruptive and here that obviously for whatever reason whether it's because audiences reacted well to that character in three, but his antics here really start to grate a little for me this time. And that every time that the film risks building up some tension, it would cut to like Simon Pegg pulling some bass or I don't know, fainting or something, or like feigning terror or surprise or shock for comic effect, and it would just take you right out of the moment. It could stand it occasionally, but it does seem that every time he's presented with a plan, he's like, We can't possibly do that. What are you crazy? It's like, Do you know the force you're joined up with? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> He seems constantly surprised that he's going to be asked to do something ludicrous, and that is really the point of the whole franchise. Well, so. I, I can only assume that the intervening five years between this and the previous film, that Benji will have accompanied these guys, or at least assisted on some other missions, and that he will by now have a fairly firm grasp of the kind of shenanigans they get up to. Yeah. And I would expect after five years that, it, <laughs> that his <laughs> yeah. reaction to the suggestion of here's how we're going to break into this thing and do what do you call it with the flute de whoop um, <laughs> wouldn't... wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't generate so much shock and surprise on his part, so much disbelief. But again, it's not, it, it doesn't completely ruin the film. I don't want people to take from that that it completely undermined it and that this is a train wreck. It's, it's not. It's still markedly better than a lot of summer blockbusters that we've, uh, you know, that we've come to, uh, we've come to expect. But I do think, as you say, this one is not going to age as well as some of, uh, something like three um, and certainly, possibly the the fifth entry, but um, more of yeah, that later. You did later. mention that uh, some of the the effects work was already starting to look a little bit ropey. Um, it was ropey at the time. It was poor for the time, really. The stuff with the sandstorm coming in and the, the destruction of the Kremlin was like really second rate, man. Yeah, I hadn't noticed it until you pointed it out. But yeah, when you, when you see the things, yes, particularly the Kremlin destruction, it does look a little bit like an iPhone filter that you get. Yeah, so, anything anything CG done at scale in this is really really uh, jarring. But yeah, there you go. But yeah, I'm still I, uh, now the crux of this. Jeremy Renner discuss because the notion, as I understand it, is that Jeremy Renner was brought in at this point in the franchise with a view to eventually replacing Tom Cruise. Uh, right. Whenever he's decided he's had enough of making Mission Impossible films, uh, presumably yeah. he'll still make little cameo appearances or something, but that Jeremy Renner will take over as team leader. I can only assume that Jeremy Renner, and I have no reason to believe otherwise, is a, a fine and gentlemanly fellow, and I'm sure I would quite happily sit and have a pint with him. I'm sure we'd have a good laugh. I do not find him a charismatic screen presence, and certainly nowhere near enough charismatic to be taken over the reins from Tom Cruise. I'd largely agree. I think he's got potential, but I've, I've never quite seen it. When you give him the ball to play with and things like the uh, Born Legacy, legacy that was the one, uh, he he does okay, but not brilliantly. Um, I'm sure if he was given the lead role in these franchises, he would do okay. He would step up his game. He would be fine, but I don't think he. I don't think he's quite got the. He's not got the charisma. He has a certain dry, sort of slightly more acerbic quality to yeah. him. Yeah, don't, don't get me wrong. A lot of situations, but I'm not sure it's going to be great for the a great fit for. Yeah, and not every man, there. not every leading man needs charisma. It's not a failing on his part. I just think it's miscast, or not necessarily miscast for these films, but in terms of the expectation placed on the character in future, I think it's. Um, I think if, it's potentially miscast. I mean, if that is the case, I mean, it, it's, it does seem in these, well, this film and uh, five that he's 
I'm sure his acting fits with the character as it's been given. And I think yeah. when he when he's given the the kind of slightly more emotional scenes where he's describing what he thinks happened with Ethan Hunt's wife at the yeah. time and things like he you know he can do all that stuff very well and probably better than Cruz himself would have done, yeah. who's prone to chewing the scenery at those kind of points, I think. Maybe it's less that Renner's incapable and more that the, the character is is incorrect. Yeah, I mean, the character is supposed to be a little bit um, antsy and cowardly is not quite the right term, but far more reserved than what he's trying to do. And that that does make him come across as more of a wet blanket. And that's kind of more, I think, where the, the problem lies if he was going to push on and do the rest. He'd need to be a bit more sort of gung-ho rather than, you know, having to kind of be a bit more reserved, which is, is really his position in these films. He's the, he's the sounding board that goes, are you sure? Have you considered this, that and the other? Yeah. Which is more of a, he's doing a bit of the exposition duty, which kind of puts the yeah. kibosh on him being able to move forward with the momentum that the, the charisma that Cruz would have. And what what I could see working and I think would be the uh, I hope would be the direction we choose to take it in is that if that is the case and that Renner takes over the reins at some point is that we see a change in tone. Yeah. That the material is more tailored to that character rather than expecting someone just to step into Cruz's shoes. But I suppose only Cruz's shoes. <laughs> but I suppose only um, only time will tell in that respect. Yeah I can see I could see him doing a somewhat more Bourne-ish role but with the kind of gadgetry that um, is enabled by them at IMF Force and a few less of the overwhelmingly crazy stunts. Yeah. Uh, he, I, I can't imagine Jeremy Renner hanging off an aircraft, put it that way. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm not saying, and I think that there's a good franchise to be made there, but possibly it's not the Mission Impossible franchise at this point. Yeah, perhaps perhaps it's its own thing, right? Perhaps yeah. it's a spin-off thing. At your mention of Tom Cruise hanging off the side of an airplane, I, <laughs> I suppose that's as good a time as any to start talking about Rogue Nation, which um, picks up pretty much exactly where four left off with Hunt and Co. confronting the Syndicate, possibly one of the most generically named, as we just called it, the gang. Um, basically an anti-IMF crew who are bent on destroying the outfit for what are initially reasons unknown. Uh, but once again, you've guessed it, Cruz and his team become disavowed. And this time they are forced to uh, not only contend with um, the leader of this anti-IMF crew, but also angry Alec Baldwin, which is a... That's uh, that could have been a separate movie all in itself. <laughs> um, Sean Harris is interesting again and again. Another really sort of low key. I mean, outside of the UK, how how well known is Sean Harris? I mean, I think he was in Prometheus, right? Yes, um, but I'm not. I'm not in t- even with that. And having seen him in things, I'm not sure I knew who Sean Harris was. Yeah, I certainly <laughs> did. I knew. I'm like, I know that guy's face. It wasn't until afterwards I remembered. Oh yeah, Prometheus. And I know I've seen him in stuff. But nothing, nothing as uh, high profile as this. Uh, Prometheus, obviously, aside in which he had a much uh, smaller role, plays Solomon Lane, the disenfranchised British agent who has set up this anti IMF force with a view to causing all manner of ruckus, getting back at his former employers. It's certainly interesting casting, though I'm not sure if that's interesting, different, or interesting, amusing. He very much, very much like him. Um, Philip Seymour Hoffman, but in a far to a far more polar degree, he sometimes manages to embody an an ooze malice, and other times, other times he'll try to appear threatening on the screen. And I find myself sitting there thinking, "I go and get your dad, pal." I mean, for a mid-level management post office worker, you're quite threatening, but you're still not quite <laughs> <laughs> enough to be carrying a multi-million-dollar franchise on your back. It's just weirdly, and it sounds terrible, but it's the it's, for the most part, it's the weirdly ineffectual. Vocal inflection that he has. I'm going to. Kill, I think I might have to kill you. That's right. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff like this going on when he talks. That's right. Do you want to fight? I need to do me a favour. Can I have a strip saw first? Yeah. Got a bit of a tickly throat. I, I, I would have you killed in your entire agency, Mister Hunt, but my blood sugar's a bit low today. <laughs> I need a bottle of Lucasaid. <laughs> then I'll get back to. <laughs> then I'll get back to you, bruv. <laughs> Um, it's, it's very strange. It's not that it, and he, in the scenes in the scenes where that character works, it it works well because it sets up that thing of this very unassuming character who who when he he does succeed in turning on the menace appropriately, it it, it does work. But there are, it's the problem that there are just moments where you know he is supposed to be being menacing and it doesn't quite come off right. Yeah, it's an odd one. I don't know how much of that is down to the casting of. Harris and how much of it is down to the direction of Christopher Macquarie I suggest a bit of both to be honest but yeah I'm not quite sure what to say, I, I really really enjoyed this entry in the franchise, this, I, it may be the thing that I, I come back to this a couple of years down the line as I did with Ghost Protocol and find that I didn't enjoy it as much as I think I did, it's the 
first one that I've seen oh no actually I tell a lie I saw the first three in the cinema so it's only four that I didn't but I really did enjoy this in the context of the cinema I'm not sure how it'll hold up on home viewing but listen there, I mean, there are some big wins in there primarily for me I mean despite the fact it's got a really overworked final act that in its own way in terms of set up and locating characters precisely where you need them to be apparently through random chance <laughs> it does require total suspension of disbelief but there's some really there's some really interesting scenes in there we get a, we get an opera opera assassination scene that's got a nice twist in that there are three potential um, assassins present and central to the plot this time round uh, transcending the sort of token love interest role is Rebecca Ferguson yeah. Um, whose character is it Ilsa the, the unprobably named Ilsa Faust that's it Ilsa <laughs> Faust is actually really really effective and proves a really good foil to um, to Cruz's Ethan Hunt there is it's a very sort of tired trope the sort of is she isn't she potentially duplicitous vixen role but she really makes the most of it um, and has good chemistry with Cruz and really f- for the duration of the film you are kind of kept on the edge of your seat by her. You you are never a hundred percent sure whether she's going to turn out to be um, friend or foe. Yeah, she was the one unalloyed positive point for me in this film. I think, mm. uh, if nothing else, it's nice to see that the franchise get a proper strong female character. It's yep. had female agents before, but frankly, they were more or less irrelevant. Well, Mission Impossible Three looked like it was going to come close in the opening act, Nearly. but then they killed yes. her. Yeah. <laughs> Spoiler alert. I don't know if it makes you feel any better that Simon Pegg is used to being the damsel in distress for quite a lot of this. So. Yes, Simon Pegg's role is greatly reined in. To his, to his credit, Christopher McQuarrie, um, and I would assume it's it has been his decision to rein Simon Pegg's character of, is it Barney? What is it again? Benji. Benji, that's it. He's reined the character of Benji back in a bit and um, it actually, it proves to work really well because there's far less of the gunning on Simon Pegg's part and actually towards the end of the film he proves to be actually be quite um, quite emotive. There's, there's a scene there which is almost genuinely touching yeah. um, involving him. However, I think also equally as crucially Christopher McQuarrie does not rein in Tom Cruise and his increasingly stupid midlife crisis stunt ponchon which, yeah. for no appreciably good reason, saw him demanding that he be strapped to the side of a, an Airbus A300 or whatever that <laughs> Hercules transport replacement is, and flown apparently up to 5,000 feet in the air, tied to the side of a plane. Yeah. Um, I mean, for no appreciably good reason. <laughs> granted, it, it looks a lot better than the train of uh, Mission Impossible 1. And it looks, <laughs> it looks better than similar sequences in films such as Eraser. <laughs> There is a certain there is a certain awe to be had during that scene of the fact that the realization that oh, Jesus they literally did tie him to the side of a plane, but afterwards you're kind of left wondering like why? Yeah, because that's the showpiece and it, it's the first five minutes of the film. I don't think it's spoiling anything to say that. Yeah, so and for you're left wondering cold after, opening. Yeah. yeah, it's like how how are you going to top that? And also, what was the necessity? Yeah, and it's another opening scene that's, that's kind of based around Simon Pegg being a bit incompetent as well, which is yeah, no, I don't want that. I don't, I don't need no. that. My fear at that point being that oh, it's an, it's going to be another another one of those. Thankfully, it swiftly changes course and becomes a bit more grounded after that. Mm. As far as these things go, there's certainly a lot of positives in there. Better characterization, I think, of mm-hmm. both Hunt and his female lead. I think that the plot itself, when you get to unraveling it at the end has more sense than a lot of the other ones. It's a bit more nuanced than just having a villain who's trying to either take over the world or get money. Yeah. And I, I do have some appreciation for that. It still seems a little bit tacked on though. Um it's mm. not I'm not quite sure what the end game of it was, but it's it, it, it's fine. To its credit, right, and this might just be me being gullible, but you mentioned before sort of going in and not trying to second guess the plot. And also, I would agree with that. I try not to do that as much as possible. When I know I'm going to see something at the cinema, I also try and insulate myself from review material and yep. chatter around the subject. And to the credit of Mission Impossible 5, there's a point in the film sort of midway, in one of the big sort of kind of action sequences, maybe disingenuous, but it is an action sequence that largely takes place underwater. Um, there's a point towards the end of that where um, something happens and I found myself sitting thinking, I can acknowledge that they're kind of setting Jeremy Renner up. I'm, I'm thinking to myself, oh, yeah. have they just done that? And I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't sure how it was going to pan out. 
yeah. and there was a, there was a there was a palpable sense of that throughout the screening we were in. I you kind of you could feel everyone else in the cinema sort of going, oh. In a summer blockbuster movie, that's not necessarily an easy thing to pull off. And I, I say I don't know if that's me just imagining other people's reaction to it and me just being particularly uh, gullible on this occasion. But I think it must speak something that there was a moment of uncertainty there, regardless of how it pans out. I wasn't buying what it was selling in that scene, to be honest with you. <laughs> right. No, that it's one, just me. That one passed me by. I think it was, a, for some reason or another, when I'm thinking about it, I have no particular axes to grind with the film, but it just somehow didn't engage me quite as much as I was expecting it to be. Mm. Uh, but it's... It is perfectly fine in everything that it's trying to do, but it just didn't quite grab me, and I couldn't quite be bothered to uh, invest any of that detail in the in the character at that point. I think, you know, I can't remember if this comes before or after. I mean, we must mention some of the dialogue in this is the worst the series has ever seen, mm. including two. It's horrible in places. Um, in particular, there's a scene with Alec Baldwin in it, who's ranting throughout but in particular there is one scene I, my memory is that this happened before that particular instance and it's, it's yes. he, he has one monologue which basically made made me go nope and stopped paying attention to it for about the next you know 15 to 20 minutes I'm trying it, to remember the exact wording of it now but it's stuck out like a sore thumb at the end of a, a, a tumult which winds up with him calling Ethan Hunt uh, a manifestation of destiny that's it it's like mm, no, that's, not buying. <laughs> that's not that that particular piece of dialogue is neither true to the character nor the movie at large. That very strange decision, very strange decision. Yeah, I'm surprised that was kept in. To be honest, puzzled me greatly. I have it's it's a nice enough sort of linking device having Alec Baldwin being this uh, CIA agent who's fed up of the uh, IMF antics, and that's yeah. fine. But this. Oh God, no, no! <laughs> the execution was not very well thought out in that case. That is the the single overriding thing, along with my reservations about um, John Harris as as the the main bad guy, which is occasionally effectual and occasionally not. Occasionally, he's cold and calculating enough for his character to work as a sort of somewhat dispassionate uh, killer, but the other times it just feels like he's a clerical worker, really, and. That doesn't quite work, and just the the overblownness of some of the dialogue started to took a bit of the bloom off the rose. I'll be interested though to see how this holds up. Uh, I think it might be something where I go back to it and actually like it more than I did initially. Mm. I think it might have that harken back to the first one in that instance. I think a good a good deal of it for me is that um, like I I perhaps at this point get a chance to go to the cinema twice a year if I'm lucky. Yeah. And so the cinema experience for me, and in a sense that's nice for me because having come from a point where uh, the three of us were going to the cinema four or five times a week to keep up yes. with sort of like every... every um, everything. Yeah. Everything, basically, <laughs> that was that was on general release. It can obviously dull the experience somewhat. And I'm back in a position now where as much as I'd like to be more, it's kind of nice to... To feel more of the cinema experience on a visit, so there may be an there may be an element of that. One of the things that stands out about this franchise was Tom Cruise taking to a franchise. It's the first franchise he'd become involved in. Tom Cruise is an actor who has somehow yeah. managed to avoid franchises otherwise, and I suspect that actually it's it's his own it's his own production company behind these movies. As far as um, I think I'm correct in saying that, um, it's a Cruise Wagner production anyway. Part of me thinks that it's a kind of like a nice little cash cow for his production company is the reason why he's chosen to involve himself in this as a franchise where he's he remained staunchly opposed to it previously. I mean, obviously now there's all sorts of talk about sequels to some of his previous movies. But I guess he's at a stage in a career where he's kind of just, I don't know, I don't want to deny his artistic integrity, but perhaps he's at a point where he's just like, yeah, check looks good. <laughs> um, it's nice to see a series like this, which, and I don't think enough people talk about this, but... For a big budget summer franchise, I mean, and way ahead of the uh, way ahead of the recent slew of super, superhero movies, uh, the Mission Impossible franchise, with the exception of two, has managed to resolutely uh, buck the law of diminishing returns. In a sense, I mean, I applaud them for not bleeding it to death. Mm. Uh, they have managed to maintain four or five year recent. gaps, isn't it? Yeah, um, they're not going back to the well too often in the way that it looks like it's going to happen with the Star Wars franchise and has happened with uh, Marvel, like the Fast and the Furious and things like the, let's just say, the Marvel films. Who knows? Who knows? There is talk of the sixth one. I think uh, Cruz confirmed it in some talk show, but I don't think it's actually confirmed. Mm. But um, I'm sure there will be another one, but you're going to have to wait a few years for it, as opposed to your contractual at least two per year Marvel outings. <laughs> Which is, you know, I, st- I still don't mind. I don't want to knock the Marvel stuff too much. It's it's competently produced for the most part. It's just a, it's all a bit samey by this point. But 
if people are still enjoying it, who are we to argue? How's he going to top tying himself to a plane? He's going to tie himself to a rocket. Uh, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> Have you seen the ending of uh, Doctor Strange Love? Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming that's how he's, he's going to go out He's going to ride it home <laughs> He's going to ride it home Whooping the whole way <laughs> Have you got a preference for uh, for sequels? As I mentioned before We've had we've had a couple of people feed back to us on Twitter tonight I know over the past couple of weeks Since the cinema uh, Sorry the film hit cinema Is obviously a hot topic Has been What's the order from best to worst Of Mission Impossible movies Everyone seems to have an opinion What's, what's yours? It's tough to say Because I think a lot of them Are very different films Despite, I mean, obviously they have very similar similar themes and whatnot, but the first film does not really seem like it's in the same series with much of the rest of it, mm. and it's almost kind of judged separately. The last two are almost interchangeable in a lot of respects, mm-hmm. so it's, it's a bit hard to say. If you were pushing me for an answer, I might say the first one at the minute. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure I would change my mind about this at points, but I mean, the first one has more obvious flaws than the other films. Too accepted, uh, but, it's but still I think the, it's more the most mission impossibly of them yeah. all. Those flaws, I think, are, can I think be forgiven as you know, are, as just elements of the time that it's in. So in that case, I'd probably go with one. I think I would currently say I still probably enjoyed four more than a lot of the other ones. So I'll put that there. Then I guess a tie between three and five. To be honest with you, I, I would probably need more distance into a rewatch of five before I can really place it with uh, any accuracy. But you could take your pick between those two and the last. Un uncontroversially would be Mission Impossible Two. What? <laughs> Who would oh, very it? dare you, sir? Very dare you? And you are yourself? uncouth and a cad. <laughs> uh, myself, I've gone for. I'd like to say um, a couple of these, bro. Three, five, and four are kind of interchangeable on any day of the week, so I've bookended it the same as you have. It starts with one and ends with two, but I've gone one, three, five, four, two. Mm. Three and five, I think, are my m- most open to discussion there. Uh, it might, on a different day, it might be one, five, three, four, two. Um, but I think that's one of the most interesting things about this franchise is that there's no clear, certainly certainly in the middle, there's no clear, um, there's no clear preference amongst the, the crowd. Yeah, the, the, the crowd their... does not come to a conclusion on this. And I think all it's probably bro- broadly reflective because all of those films have their strong points and their weak points and mm. very rarely are they the same weak and strong points. Yeah. Uh, and I will say I will say for this for two, although resolutely it, it is the constant that seems to come at the bottom of everyone's list. It, at least it is distinctive in style, at least as distinctive in style as the first movie. Those, those first two very much have their own vibe, for, for better or worse in the case of the second film. The second one certainly has doves. Yes. Oh yes, it has <laughs> doves. I had this discussion with someone last night that I wasn't sure there were doves in it, um, and oh, one, of my, uh, one of my contacts on Twitter assured me, no, I'm pretty sure they're in there, and bang, right on the two <laughs> hour mark. And again, at two hours and three minutes, and I think 33 seconds, if I recall correctly, <laughs> there will be doves. Just to give a shout out to some of our FUDs on Film followers on Twitter, we've had Stuart from Glasgow. Uh, he goes by the handle of Minute5072. He His preference would be 54312. Um, that just sounds like you're having difficulty counting backwards from five, to be honest with you, Stuart. <laughs> um, no, no, I can I can get behind that. I'm a bit, I'm a bit disappointed to see that he's placed one second from the end there, but to each their own, Stuart, to each their own. Fraser from Boness, good old Sonny Boness. How you doing, Fraser? He has... He has given an order that on an, another day I could get behind one five three four two. Um, I think that's the yeah. I think that's my other day scenario that I gave earlier. Actually, so I can uh, I can certainly empathise with that. Please do let us know if any more of you have any thoughts or feelings on this or any other topic. To be honest with you, get in contact with us individually on Twitter. You can find me at Craig Eastman. You can find Scott Morris cunningly at Scott Morris, and I think you can find Drew Tavendale even more cunningly at Drew Tavendale. I'm at Scott underscore Morris. What? Ah, you master of perhaps, the guys. Perhaps what you may want to do is simply follow at Fuds on Film, yes. and you'll get us all that way. This is uh, where I was heading. You can you can you can fire us uh, all a message at, at Fuds on Film. Give us a follow. Give us a retweet. Of course. What would be a massive help is uh, if any of you can be bothered to get on iTunes in whichever country you're in and yes, leave us a review. We apologise. Let me know how terrible iTunes is, but if you could yes. possibly get, see your way to it. Do us a favour. But if you want to uh, if you want to download us and interact with us through your uh, your podcast app of choice uh, and not bother at all with visiting iTunes, we can 
absolutely understand that. <laughs> you you interact with us how you choose. Yes, yeah, also Facebook, Facebook slash Fuds on Film. Facebook, is Facebook still a thing? The kids yeah. still into Facebook. The kids still love their Facebook. It's, mm, they it's loves them some Facebook. Rumours of the MySpace revival proved unfounded. You can find us on Craigslist, but I'm not going to tell you how. <laughs> We're not advertising podcasts. <laughs> and of course, I think also if you're, uh, what's that new cutting edge technology, Scott? Is it email? Is it? Uh, I think you can reach us podcast at budsonfilm dot com. I think it's pronounced Amol. <laughs> there you go, Amol. Um, you can reach us by email. <laughs> yeah, um, send us a baguette or something electronically. We'll get the message. <laughs> um, on that note, I think it's probably time to wrap up, uh, unless there's anything else you wanted to throw into the mix, Scott. That covers it for now. We'll be back in a mere ten days or so with our Clint Eastwood extravaganza. Oh, nice, nice. That's one to look forward to. Um, and I think also at some point there in the interim we'll be banging up um, a commentary in relation to that for the 1975 Clint Eastwood magnum opus, The Iger Sanction. <laughs> His special treat. <laughs> I know it was a treat for us watching it um, and co- offering you our comments on it so it'd be lovely if you get a chance to listen to that I suppose with that said it's time to say cheerio so I was Craig and Scott was Scott cheerio and I'm sure if he were here uh, today and not living at large in Paris Drew would be saying cheerio also so cheerio from Drew we'll speak to you again in 10 days bye bye other breakfast cereals are available <laughs>